Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, the topic of this talk is composing AI applications as a graph with Haystack. And it's uh, the second time I'm delivering this sort of talk. And full disclaimer, um, I think uh, the second time around, I've learned that the name might be a bit um, misleading because a lot of people see the word graph here and they're expecting knowledge graphs. I saw a really good talk by Neo4j yesterday. This is not about knowledge graphs, it's more about um, an approach to building AI applications or workflows, if you will, which led to us at DeepSet making a full major release of our open source framework, Haystack. So I'm going to be talking about um, why we came to this conclusion, how we designed Haystack, and then there'll also be some coding. Hopefully it all goes well. Um, all right, so my name is Twana. Uh, I'm based in Amsterdam, so I'm only here for the day. Uh, and I work in the developer relations team at DeepSet, and we're fully focused on Haystack, which is, like I said, our open source AI framework. I'm briefly going to cover this uh, agenda. So first, I'm going to talk about our approach to building with AI technologies. And to narrow down the scope, everything I'm going to be talking about is actually language technologies. So language models, large language models, embedding models, and so on. This is going to be a nice um, intro into Haystack and specifically Haystack 2.0. And then we'll build some stuff. We'll build out our own AI graphs. All right, so AI application is a very general term, I realize. So does, is there anyone here who does not know what RAG is or Retrieval Augmented Generation? Okay, all right, so let's do a very simple intro into what it is anyway. Um, so RAG, the idea behind RAG is, let's say we have some data stored somewhere. This might be a vector database, and we want to do something with it. Uh, so we have an instruction. In this case, this instruction is a question answering instruction or a prompt, if you will. Given the documents, answer the following question, and we have documents and a uh, question. What's happening step by step to achieve a RAG application is someone asks a question, in an ideal world, we're able to extract from our database the most relevant context for this question. And then we're quite literally augmenting that prompt or instruction with the contents of um, the document that we extracted. And if you take a step back, there's two main things that's happening here. The first thing that's happening is the retrieval step, where we're going into a vector database, we're probably doing some sort of embedding search, and we're retrieving some documents. And then the second major step that's happening uh, is the generation step, where we're using one of many large language models out there, or many, many providers out there, and that's producing an answer for us. But this, actually, this view is overlooking quite a few other things that are happening under the hood. And actually, there was a very similar graph in the previous presentation to what I'm going to show you now. But if you dig deeper into what's going on here, we're actually doing quite a lot of things. Where the, the query is coming in from the user, and initially, we're embedding that query. We're actually representing that query as a vector itself. So that's one step. That's one task. And then it's the embedding that we're delivering to the retrieve uh, documents step. And that's then going ahead and retrieving it from um, a document store or a vector store. And then it's the documents that we're providing to a step that I feel like we often even overlook as a step. But we're actually creating this instruction. We're creating this prompt. Maybe we want documents in here. Maybe we want documents and, I don't know, URLs if we're if we're embedding contents of links, for example, as well as the query from the user. The next thing we're doing in the last step is we're providing this entire prompt that was produced thanks to all of these steps be before to a generative model. Let's talk about something completely different, because like I said, AI application is a very, very general term. There can be many applications of AI or AI technology. Let's say you don't yet have your embeddings in a database. You have to create those embeddings somehow. You've got your document, and you know what database you want to add them to. And what that looks like under the hood, it can contain many, many steps, actually. This is one of the most simple ways you might embed data. You're cleaning up your document, maybe. Maybe it's got things that you don't need in there. Maybe you're splitting them up. Um, large language model models do not have infinite context length. Maybe you have to split them up. 
And then you're embedding those splits, maybe, and you're, again, having to make some choices around what model am I using, what embedding model am I using to make this happen. All in all, I hope this starts to look like these look similar, uh, because each of them, both RAG and this, consists of multiple very simple tasks, actually, combined in a way to achieve the end result that you want, whether that's RAG or embedding into a data store. Another thing, uh, and this up till here formed actually the basis of how we designed Haystack 1, Haystack 1.x, let's say. Another thing that often happens is maybe, maybe, we don't, maybe we don't need just one pass. Maybe we need optionality in the way our application reacts. So an example of that is, um, and there's a tutorial on this on our website if you want to, if you want to check it out, but what if we want our workflow or application to react in a certain way. Let's say you had RAG, but your database didn't actually contain the answer to the question that the user was asking. Maybe you want something to say, oh, okay, so in this case, actually go do web search. So you can start to see that there's a branching happening around here. So all of this actually formed the basis of how we initially designed Haystack 1.x. And this was back in 2020, Haystack 1.x was released. 1.0 was officially released in 2020. And the graphs that you were seeing, all these nodes that were forwarding data to the next, um, were called components. And the graph itself we called pipelines. And maybe some of you already know what this is, but at the end of the day, this is actually a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, where data is flowing from one end, where each component or node is transforming that data in some way to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's actually irrelevant whether that full pipeline is RAG or embedding or summarization or well, anything else, really. And then something shifted in the way we started to use large language models. This is where you start to hear lots of things about uh, agentic um, workflows, where it's not just about one instruction, maybe it's about breaking down a full instruction into steps, or maybe self-reflecting, etc. So that brought us to March this year, where we released Haystack 2.0. And basically what we did was get rid of the A in DAG. So instead of having this graph or pipeline be acyclic, now we're actually allowing for cycles. What does this mean? It means that these graphs, I'm going to be referring to them as pipelines from now on. These pipelines effectively can become services that run until a certain condition is met, maybe. Maybe they can be um, programmed in a way that they're actually able to do self-reflection and so on. Effectively, it's made it so that the pipelines in Haystack have become agentic by nature. And it's completely up to you how you design, design your um, pipeline into what, what it actually does, whether that's self-reflection or breaking down tasks or whatever. Uh, this QR code actually takes you to the announcement article that we released on, on the day that we released Haystack 2.0, which goes into quite detail. And we also talk about what we did wrong with Haystack 1.x and why we decided to change the fundamentally changed how the uh, framework operates. So I'm going to start building uh, some simple pipelines, but I need to do some prep work to make sure that everyone knows that, what I'm showing you. Prompting in Haystack um, is done with Jinja templating. So you can um, have these curly brackets that effectively become input to what we call a prompt builder. It's quite cool because it also means that in our prompt we can define for loops, if statements, and so on, which is quite handy, especially for pipelines that loop. We'll see that in a bit. And I quickly want to cover how a component is made, how you can create components. And we only have a few requirements. A component is effectively a class. You can think of this as a node in the graph. This is a class that is uh, decorated with components and it has a run method. That run method describes to you what inputs the component is expecting, but we're also describing what the output and output types are. This allows for the pipeline to validate that the connections are actually you know, something that it can work with. So this here, very creatively called component, is a very valid haystack component, by the way. It's just something that outputs an empty string. Um, but let's say Haystack doesn't provide you a translator. I'm making this up. You could 
very well go ahead and create your own translator. Here I've got a component called translator that expects three things from and to Lang, as well as some documents. And if I've done my job correctly, then it's saying that it's outputting something called documents and the type is list of document. And then I can use this and attach it in my pipeline to any other component that is able to accept document or is providing the inputs that this needs. That's basically all you need to create a component. Of course, we do have many of these components available in Haystack, so it's not like you have to go ahead and create all your components yourself. Um, this is just a bunch of them. We've got embedders, we've got generators, preprocessors, prompt builders, and so on. You get the idea. So with this, I think it's time for me to switch over to VS Code and hope that everything runs correctly. So I want to start off by showing you some components and running the component itself. Here, I've simply got an OpenAI document embedder, and I'm using this model. And you can also have a look at what this component is expecting as input. So it's saying I'm expecting documents, and it's going to be a list of documents, and I'm going to be producing documents and meta. So I can go ahead and run this uh, component on its own without attaching it to anything in a pipeline. Great, I've embedded two dummy documents, and it's actually telling me that they've got, uh, I think somewhere it should say embeddings or vector size something. Great. Now let's actually create some pipelines. I'm going to create two types of pipelines. I'm going to do an indexing pipeline where we're going to be writing documents into. For now, I'm going to use in-memory document store. It's the simplest thing to do. So let's first check our in-memory document store has zero documents in it. I'm going to be using the link content fetcher because I want to embed the contents of some URLs. I'm then going to convert them with an HTML to document to something that Haystack can use. And then I'm going to create embeddings and write them to my uh, database. The first thing I need to do is actually create the pipeline, or I wish it wouldn't do this. And then I simply add those components. But this is where it gets a bit interesting because I can be very verbose about exactly how I want those connections to look like, one after the other. And then another utility tool we have, which is quite nice, is you can actually print it out and see, OK, the first thing is Fetcher, and it's actually expecting URLs. So I have to provide URLs to my pipeline somehow. And then you can check if the connections are what you actually expect. Sometimes pipelines can get quite complex, so it's quite handy to have this. I'm going to go ahead and embed the contents of two uh, pages we have, one about Mistral uh, integrations and one about Cohere integrations we have. And OK, great. And if I now check my document store, I've got two documents in there with the embeddings. Perfect. Now let's start to actually use these documents for a RAG pipeline. Like I sh showed you before, we use Jinja templating. So this means I can create this prompt and documents and query now are becoming inputs to that node in the pipeline. So let's run this. And then, as you can see, uh, we're going to use connect again, but I'm going to be very, very specific as to what should be added to the documents input of the prompt. So I'm saying the thing that Retriever is returning, the documents that the Retriever is returning, add that to prompt documents, and then I can actually add the content of it in here. OK, so let's do that. And then let's just check what's going on here just in case. Great, we've got the query embedder, we've got the retriever. The retriever documents are being provided to documents in prompt, and so on. And then I can just maybe ask a question. Um, what are the available Mistral components? Maybe I should have run this before. And there we are. We've got a reply from the LLM component. And it's telling me that the available components are Mistral document embedder, text embedder, and that's probably one more, which is correct, I can tell you, so great. All right, so these have all been one past graphs or pipelines, if you will. Next, I want to build something a bit fancier. So what you're seeing here is we're going to actually be asking the LLM itself to self-reflect on whether it has, in fact, extracted all of the available entities. We're not going to tell it anything about entities. I'm not saying that this is the right way to extract entities. I just want to showcase how you can actually implement these loops. So we've got quite a long instruction here, but 
effectively we're going to have text as input. And the important thing here is we've got this if block. So this prompt node in our graph is basically going to say, if you get something called entities to validate, try validate them. <laughs> are, they the, are they the final entities you want to go with, or do you want to go with something else? And again, I'm not saying this is the perfect way to do this, but I'm just basically instructed that say done somewhere if you think you're done. OK, fine. We create this prompt. And I've created my own component that um, produces either entities, so it's decided that it is done. Great. Or it's going to return entities to validate, which we're going to add to the prompt, if it decides it's not done. And I'm also going to print it out in red so that it's easy to see. All right. And then I simply create this pipeline and notice how entities validator entities to validate are going into prompt entities to validate. This is going to look kind of complex, but when I show this pipeline, I hope it starts to make sense that entities to validate, if there are entities to validate, we go back. And if there are none, we output the entities. Now, this does take some time to run, so I've run it already, but I've simply copy-pasted the, um, the schedule description for this talk from the AI Dev website. And the first time it decided it was not done because simply I've been looking at this and I think the only thing it wasn't happy about is that Python was given the entity um, language. So it changed that to programming language. It decided it was not good enough and it decided to change that to programming language. But you can see that it, went, it took two loops. Loop one, nope, we're not happy yet. Loop two, okay, we're happy, we're done. All right, let's go on. So the point I'm trying to make is these types of pipelines, these types of graphs can become quite complex, actually, depending on what you're trying to build. And the point that, uh, the, or let's say the ethos behind Haystack is not to provide everything you might need. Like the entities validator, I just made that up. Like I, we didn't have anything like that. Maybe I could have used another component we have for that reason. But you can bring your own. So if there's something that you need to build that we don't provide, the components um, that I showed you with the decorator and the run method, those are literally the only requirements we have for anything really to become a node in your graph or a component in your pipeline. So the last thing I want to showcase is a demo that um, my colleague Stefano built. And this actually uses three different pipelines and he's created his own um, custom component as well. This is called the auto quizzer. And the only thing it's doing is it's expecting a URL and it's generating a quiz based on the content of that URL. But he's actually gone ahead and created a quiz parser component for Haystack. So Haystack is now able to create a JSON object that represents a quiz, which we can then give to Gradio. Gradio is a really useful tool, by the way, if you want to create uh, UIs to quickly demo applications. So let's go ahead and do that. And hopefully, so I've provided a URL uh, about capybaras. And there you go, we've got a quiz about capybaras. And then you can go ahead and answer questions. I have no idea what I'm saying here. But actually, the quiz parser that he's created also provides the correct answer as like meta information. So we can go ahead and submit that. I've done badly. Um, so you get a score. But you can also go ahead and ask the LLM itself to solve its quiz it's created for itself. We've got two pipelines here. One of them is a closed book exam, so it's not doing any type of rag. It's based on the knowledge of, in this case, Llama 3, and he's used Grok to serve Llama 3. Um, so you can ask it to, okay, 60%. Ideally, if it's doing web rag, that means it's actually augmenting its um, prompt with context that it's retrieved from the web. Sometimes it actually doesn't do better. <laughs> I hope it does, but mostly it should be doing better, right? Because it's doing some web search as well. There you go. I guess, I guess the web doesn't have enough uh, context on capybaras. Um, but let's go, and uh, the last thing I want to show you is how the quiz is actually built, because I think this is pretty cool. So we've got a component called quiz parser, and this component is going to be outputting something called quiz, as a dict, 
great. And it's, ex it's expecting replies. Replies is the name of the output of most of Haystack generators. So basically it's saying, I'm going to be getting replies from an LLM. And I'll show you how that happens, but we've got quite the prompt here. It's telling the LLM exactly how to generate the quiz. And effectively, it's telling it to generate a JSON description of a quiz. This um, doesn't always work great, but this is why we also have a JSON validator component that we could add here to check that it's like in the format that we want. But let's say we don't do that for now. And we simply have this pipeline where the link content fetcher fetches content, the converter converts that, we then provide it to this huge prompt, and that huge prompt then gives a quiz to a generator, or like an instruction to create a quiz. And then the final thing is quiz parser. This takes some time, um, but let's quickly show you how you can check that the graph is what you expect it to be. Um, this takes some time, so I have run it. Here, I'm, I've asked it uh, to, again, create the quiz for capybaras. And you can see that it's got the question, the options, the right, right option as in correct answer. Uh, so this is how we can forward this information to Gradio to then populate the front end, basically. The final thing I want to add is I just added this uh, because Stephen um, mentioned that he used to uh, do a lot of YAML. Um, so just a little tidbit. This is extra. This is serialization. Uh, you can also represent all of your Haystack pipelines as YAML, or you can also bring your own formats in. So you can, I don't know if you know what a Marshaller is, but you can bring your own custom Marshaller and say, I want my pipelines to be represented in JSON or TOML or whatever that is, but the default is YAML. Uh, and you simply just, you know, in this case, I've dumped it to a string, and then I can print this out. And this is the de description of that entire quiz generation pipeline. I can then use that serialized pipeline to load it back into a pipeline. This is useful because it means that you can just have pipelines defined in a format, and you can send it down the wire, and you can distribute it to any type of machine you want. And then I can literally run that same pipeline the way I did the previous one and create a quiz. In this case, I created a quiz about Fiat Panda. And uh, I have no idea, I know nothing about Fiat Panda, so let's not actually solve that quiz. But there you go. And that's basically it uh, for my talk. Um, one thing, uh, one extra thing I can uh, show you, especially because in relation to this quiz generation, uh, one uh, pipeline, specifically looping pipeline that we have, that is quite useful to validate that uh, structured output is abiding by the structure that you need it to be, um, you can always create an output validator. So in this tutorial, what we're doing is we're providing um, a JSON schema, we're using Pydantic, and we're asking a large language model to generate structured outputs that abide by the JSON schema. That doesn't always work. It does, it's not that the first time round that the large language model is going to get the exact output in the exact schema that you want. So what we are doing is we're looping back if it's invalid because we get Pydantic to actually validate. If it's invalid, we go back and add to our prompt both the invalid replies and the error message we got. And then we ask it to repeat this until it's, um, it's uh, produced the correct answer. We are able to cap that. So loops, we can always describe a maximum loop. So you're not infinitely querying OpenAI and racking up a bill. But you can always set the max loops to, I don't know, 10 or something like that. And you safeguard yourself. That means that it doesn't necessarily work all the time but it's a good safeguard. And with that, uh, I hope that made sense and you enjoyed it. And I, can, I think I can answer some questions. Yes, I can definitely answer some questions. Yes. Um, it de depends on how you implement your loop. Uh, so for this example, we actually set a limit. So we say, you know, you've got 10 tries to go, but if it exceeds 10, we make it, basically we make it crash, but that's because we've chosen to make it crash. 
in the example here that I gave you, where it's, um, let me show you the entities generation example, it decided to stop because the entity validator returns something called entities. And that entities output is not being added back into any other component. So effectively, that's the end of the pipeline. That's the end of the go. It depends on how you implement it. I think here, I still add the max loops allowed, just in case. It, this particular one has never gone over three, four loops, so it's fine. I feel like it's avoiding hallucinations. When you say that, I'm mainly thinking about something that has to refer to actual fact. In this case, because we're ask, the task is totally different. The task is extract entities. So it's difficult to say if something is a hallucination or just badly constructed entities. Um, it could be a way to avoid hallucinations. I feel like the um, rag is probably the more accurate thing to say. This uh, tries to avoid hallucinations. Any other? Yes. Llama index, slang chain, haystack. Um, I get this question a lot, and let's be very honest, they're all solving pretty much the same thing. It's mostly about what kind of um, customization or developer experience you want. Now, haystack, I've used both haystack and lang chain and llama index, and I, the, there's an audience for all of them. Haystack is very verbose. You saw the talk before, in like three, four lines, um, we had achieved basically what we have up here in many, many lines. This means that I have full control and full flexibility as to how I'm customizing it. There's, Haystack isn't meant to provide you many abstractions. We've pretty much provided one good layer of abstraction to build pipelines in one line, and we've called them pipeline templates. And you can just say dot from template rag. But we've only done that for the most obvious ones, like uh, we've got it for rag and indexing, I think. The point of the framework isn't to be, isn't there for people who want an easy way out and have a solution like tomorrow. It's more about this is a framework for people who have to be very specific about every step of a full application, you know. Yeah, I mean, and this is another thing we all often see as well. Like a lot of the, uh, I'm, I'm very close to the Haystack community and we see so many custom components because it's for people who need to say, oh, you know what, I just need this functionality slotted into my ecosystem. And I don't think the last few demos I've built, every single one of them has had a custom component. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I can leave you with one last thing because I think it's fun too. This is a demo that I built. It's on Hugging Face. Please don't use Mixtral because I broke it somehow. <laughs> but you can pick GPT. And what it does is it produces Hacker News summaries. You can select from one to five of the current trending Hacker News posts and references them as well. So if you want to know the top three Hacker News posts right now, you can go and ask for a summary. But obviously, we didn't have a Hacker News fetcher, right? So I had to build my own Hacker News fetcher. Uh, and this was to showcase uh, custom components in Haystack. All right, thank you.